Hi everybody, muy buenas noches. Uh, vamos a esperar tantito hasta que todos se puedan conectar. Um, we're going to do the uh, talk tonight in a mixture of English and Spanish and Spanglish and true to our cross-border nature. <laughs> and we're trying to try and keep things informal and light. You can ask questions in either language. We're hoping that everybody had a chance to play with some of the resources that were sent around yesterday. Espero que les llegaron un correo con unos detalles de la plataforma de Baja Flora. Parece que hay más y más personas llegando. Vamos a esperar un poquito más. Voy a compartir la liga de Baja Flora aquí en el chat. Me deja. La gente sigue llegando. Vamos a esperar un minutito más. <laughs> John, you're very popular. <laughs> We're all like-minded. All of this botany loving. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's go ahead and get started. Um, so for anyone that wasn't here at the beginning, we've advertised this talk in English, but we're gonna try and keep it informal, keep it binational and bilingual and light and do a mixture of English and Spanish and Spanglish. <laughs> Pero uh, para comentarles antes de empezar, vamos a estar agramando um, todo el evento and it's gonna be on the museum's YouTube in a few weeks. Tienen la opción de apagar la pantalla. Um, los micrófonos van a estar en mute durante el evento hasta el final. And you will have the chance to ask questions and participate in the question and answer session at the end. But we will be recording. So if you don't want to be recorded, feel free to turn off your screens. You may or may not know that April is Citizen Science Month. Mr. the Ciencia Ciudadana in April. Um, the NAT runs a whole series of events for Citizen Science Month, including El Biblis de la Frontera, que va a estar todo el mes de abril, y también a uh, finales de abril está el reto naturalista urbano, and I think you're going to hear a little bit more about that in a minute in some events in Ensenada. So we're going to share some links in the chat um, as we go through the event tonight. And gracias a todos por estar aquí y acompañarnos. So, um, I'm Sula van der Plank. I'm the Director of Terrestrial um, Ecosystem Conservation Programs for Puna Tour Noroeste, but I also have the honor of being um, Investigadora Asociada con el Departamento de Botánico del NAT, del Museo de Historia Natural de, de San Diego con John Redman, el famoso John Redman. Um, and I'm accompanied tonight <laughs> by um, the Nats Curator of Botany and National Geographic Explorer, Dr. John Ribman. But before I hand the microphone to John, I would also like to introduce our very special guests, Jorge Valdez Villavicencio, uh, Coordinador de Proyectos y Investigación for Fauno del Noroeste, y también el es tutor naturalista para el Estado de Baja California, y la doctora Ani Peralta, uh, directora ejecutiva de Fauna del Noroeste AC también. Si quieren decir unas palabras. 
Hola, ¿qué tal? Buenas noches, pues, eh, eh, pues bienvenidos a, a esta charla o esta capacitación. Y bueno, en mi caso solamente decirles que, que creo que les va a ser de mucha ayuda y bueno, yo estaré apoyando un poco, poco con, con la traducción o también si algo se atora por ahí en cuanto a la plática del doctor Redmond. Saludos. Sí, yo igual, gracias eh, por estar aquí, gracias por la invitación. Al igual que Jorge, trabajo en la Asociación Fauna del Noroeste, que nos dedicamos a hacer investigación para conservación. Y bueno, es un placer trabajar y colaborar con, con el famoso John Redman también y la famosa Sula Van der Plank. Y pues estaremos aquí apoyándolo en el chat en algunas preguntas. Y bueno, también esperemos que esta charla sea de útil para nuestras observaciones de naturalista. Is there anything going on tomorrow that people should know about? Bueno, ah, bueno, en mi caso solo comentarles, mañana estará dando una plática, eh, solo introduciendo un poco sobre qué es el reto naturalista urbano, eh, más enfocado a la ciudad de Ensenada, para los que quieran participar o los que iban alrededor de Ensenada, y pues va a ser un mini taller de cómo utilizar eh, eh, la plataforma o la aplicación naturalista para poder participar en el taller, ¿no? Entonces, pues los invito a esta será mañana y igual aquí en el chat les voy a poner el link de la de, de, sobre el, de los datos de la plática por si alguien está interesado, ¿no? Bueno, Ani y Jorge van a estar aquí ayudándonos con preguntas durante y al final de la, la plática, pero sin más demora, tengo el gusto de presentarles al doctor John Redman. All right. <laughs> I think we're ready to get started. Let me go ahead and share the screen here. Okay, can everybody see that okay? Sula? Okay, yes, cool. it's beautiful, uh, yeah. Okay, perfecto. Okay, buenas noches a todos. Uh, Primero, lo siento, porque hace mucho tiempo desde la última vez yo estuve hablando en español. Por eso vamos, voy a hablar en los dos idiomas esta noche. So, uh, ojalá es, alguien está perdido, no puedo entender cualquiera. Por favor, pone dentro del chat. Um, la primera cosa, de, voy a hablar sobre la flora general de toda la península. Y después un poco sobre de recursos digitales uh, en botánica de que es dis, dis, uh, disponible para ustedes a usar. Y la última parte es cómo mejorar las observaciones específicamente uh, por uh, iNaturalist. Um, so, first, I think it's very important to understand the diversity of the peninsula that we're dealing with because the project that we have started um, for this region is called the Flora de Baja California. And it will work, uh, the project works for los dos estados por el norte en Baja California y también al sur en el estado de Baja California Sur. And I think it's important to realize that the diversity of plants we have are a direct reflection of the diversity of habitats, ecoregions, climates, everything that is going on on the peninsula. Uh, for example, as many of you know, the, um, let me see if I can get my mouse working here. Uh, the Northwestern part of the peninsula is basically an area that gets uh, solamente lluvias in the invierno but it's very different than the southern part, which gets the lluvias solamente en el verano. So, entre los dos climas, es posible uh, tener un poco de influencia de los dos uh, climas, en el verano y también en el invierno. Pero en algunas partes, por ejemplo, en el desierto de Vizcaino, en la parte central, it's, it's, a veces es como ocho años sin lluvia en esta parte. Pero todavía hay algunas uh, uh, agua aquí en la forma de nie uh, neblina. So that is kind of an important part of the peninsula. The climate along with the topography, the isolation, um, and all of these things contribute to get the plants that we have in the region. And some of the areas like the Desierto Central, uh, tiene muchas plantas grandes, suculentas, muy carismáticos, 
uh, like the Sirius, the, um, the Cochal, eh, the Cardón, y todo en esta parte. So, so it's a uh, paisaje muy interesante, especialmente con uh, the Sirius, or the bosques de Sirius, it's como un paisaje, paisaje de Dr. Seuss in esta parte. Then you can move over into like the northeastern part of the peninsula and you have the Desierto de San Felipe. Hay muchos cactus, está, está mucho más calor en esta parte de peninsula y menos lluvia también. En la mayoría de la diversidad de las plantas son anuales en esta parte. So, por ejemplo, este año no es un año con mucha lluvia. So, tal vez la mayoría de este desierto no tienes muchos diversidad de anuales en, en esta parte. Pero hay cactáceas, uh, por ejemplo, mucho choya. Uh, bueno, hay mucho choyas en toda la península, pero también el garambullo el cenita está aquí, en el catillo también. Now, one of the things that's interesting throughout a lot of the peninsula is the presence of elephant trees, what we would say copal or trote o copaquín. And hay un diversidad de este tipo de forma de, de crecimiento. Uh, por ejemplo, the Bursera microphylla is very common throughout the entire peninsula, uh, ranging from the extreme northern part with San Diego and the U.S. all the way to the Cape region. Other species are much more restricted on the peninsula, but these are all different elephant trees. Um, and I think we have something like 12 different species of elephant trees on the peninsula, which is a very diverse area. And I'm pointing in the, the lower left, there's also a, uh, a type of pohi, pero es una familia diferente, it's in the familia Lorantasi, and tiene flores para uh, chuparosas, uh, pero está normalmente usando torotes, copal, uh, también ciruelo en el sur, um, pero es, es casi exclusivamente de este tipo de forma uh, de vida. The other group that's really interesting, it's also an elephant tree, it's usually called copalquín, is in the Anacardiaceae, and this is the genus Pachycormis. Pachycormis is endemic to the peninsula, um, es un endémico de este género de, de la península, pero es, es uh, muy diferente que de otra torota y copal en la familia Berseraceae. Now you move to the Desierto de Vizcano, and I said this is a fog desert in this region. It's very, very frequent fogs, and you see things like uh, epiphytes growing on the cardones, epifitas como uh, mezcalillo. Uh, this is Palangia recurvata, growing right on the cardones in this area of the peninsula. And also it happens farther south in this region. You go a little further inland here, you also get frequent fogs going into the Sierra de San Francisco, which is like the Grand Canyon of the peninsula with all of its huge canyons and a lot of diversity in this area from both the north and the south. The floristic diversity kind of mixes in this region. Hay algunos géneros como Baja Kelia. Hay tres especies en la península. Uh, una, eh, dos son endemic, endémicas, pero de otra es, es uh, solamente, bueno, es, es en Baja California, pero también en Sonora. Uh, por ejemplo, es la Baja Kelia crassifolia. Hay tres especies, and this is un padrón muy típico de algunos endemismos uh, en nuestra área. Con, Un ejemplar, una, una planta endémica de, de Gulfo en esta parte, una de, de Isla de Magdalena, y también de Cedros en la Punta de Vizqueno. Then you move a little farther south, you get the Corredor de la Giganta. Esta área está muy difícil ¿no? a, a caminar porque hay muchos cantiles de, de todas partes. And algunas de plantas endémicas son adaptivas de este tipo de vida. Uh, por ejemplo, estas son tres especies endémicas de esta área, pero uh, dos de la familia Loesace, de otras de familia Astoracea. And, pero los tres pueden uh, plantear sus uh, semillas dentro de roca. So, después, well, I'll explain it better in English. The flower uh, gets pollinated, it is out away from the wall. The 
after pollination, when it turns to a fruit, it actually elongates its pedicels and it goes into the rock face. So you can actually see them planting their own seeds here into that. And not only do the loisaceae, but the, this uh, peridoli lobata also does that. Now moving to the Cape region, this is our summer rainfall uh, regime, much more tropical in nature. In fact, there's a lot of affinity to tropical deciduous forest over in Southern Sonora in Sinaloa to the species that we have in the, the Region del Cabo. Um, but uh, there's still a lot of uh, endemism in this area, especially in the, the sky islands like the Sierra de Laguna. And that is one of the important things that the peninsula has. It's not just the isolation on the peninsula, but there's a backbone of Sierras that runs the entire length of the peninsula. And the high mountaintops create islas, uh, sky islands of, of climate, basically. And so you have a lot of species that are restricted just to these high points along the peninsula. And many of them have evolved into that area and they are unique to these sky islands, like the Sierra San Pedro Marte would be a good example, or the Sierra de la Laguna. But pretty much most of the ranges actually have a lot of some endemism in them. Now, you can't talk about the peninsula without talking about the islands. Uh, como, por ejemplo, los islas del Pacifico and el Oeste, and también the islas del Golfo. So there is a lot of endemic plants on all of these. Uh, things like Xylanagra, Cylindrophantia cedrosensis, Quercus cedrosensis, which is, is not restricted to cedros, it's just named from there, but it actually comes all the way up to San Diego. Um, other species that are more restricted, like Dudleya pachyphytum and Cochimia pondii, that's all on cedros. You move to the Gulf Islands, they have endemics as well, not as many in plants as you do find on the Pacific Islands, but these are all examples of uh, plants son endemicas, the Isla Angel de la Guarda, uh, the Areogonums, Hoffmeisteria, Penstemon, and Feral Cactus. And of course, some of the Gulf Islands have some amazing uh, examples of evolution. Uh, for example, the largest barrel known in the world, the largest species, is Feral Cactus spaghetti. And that is actually me, and I am not a short person. I estoy bastante alto. Uh, I'm about six foot three. And you can see that how tall that plant actually is in the, in the field. So that's what we know about the peninsula as far as what's created the diversity and where some of the diversity is. But if you want to learn what that diversity is, you can actually use this publication. So esta publicación is recentemente, is de 2016. And this is sobre the information adentro is sobre toda la flora de la península y sus islas. Um, and ustedes pueden uh, descargar esta uh, PDF directamente a su teléfono o tu computadora cualquiera de the, the sitio baja flora. Um, and Por qué tenemos esta publicación? Hay más información sobre la diversidad de las plantas en la península. Por ejemplo, hay más o menos cuatro miles de taxones de plantas diferentes aquí en la península. So this is with actual specimens documenting uh, that kind of diversity. Um, con eso, por este momento al menos hay un poco más diversidad en el estado de Baja California and un poco menos en el estado de Baja California Sur. Um, pero lo más importante aquí es de, de toda la flora es casi um, 26 porcentaje de las plantas son endémicas de la península. This is muy alto, uh, muy, muy alto para una uh, a península that's actually connected to the mainland. That is diversity that you would find on like an island in many areas. So that makes the plants of our region very, very unique. So how is it that you can actually use this checklist? This is everything that we currently know about the flora and you can use it in many different ways. <clears throat> so what is inside is there's I literatura sobre um, una grupa de las plantas, por ejemplo, uh, we have taxonomic literature that you could use to identify 
plant in that particular area. Or for cada taxon, I information, I synonyms, there's information on its distribution, it's what ecoregions it occurs in, where it's spread outside, whether it's listed in the US or in Mexico, like the norma oficial or cualquiera, um, and nombres comunes in, in English y español si hay. Hay muchas veces no hay um, nombres en español. Eso es un problema. Um, por ejemplo, esto es una género endémica, Hartfordia. Hay tres uh, taxa. Bueno, probablemente de, es necesario poner esos como especies, pero ahora son variedades. Um, you can get to this particular one, this variety, Hartfordia, Macropra variety Galioides. You can see some information about it, and then you see these little uh, abbreviations. And this directly relates, this is coastal sage scrub. You can see that it gets into coastal sage scrub. It gets into coastal succulent scrub. It gets into central desert, and it makes it to the Viscano desert. That's what that notation is. And that gives you an idea. If you're collecting over in this area, then very likely that plant is not going to uh, be there. Um, so that it gives a lot of information about every single plant that we have on the peninsula. So where do you find all of this? Here on bajaflora.org. And there are a ton of different resources that are available to you. It is completely open. Uh, you can go to this website and you can get to pretty much everything. And I'm going to give you some more things that are available on this site. So not only does, is the checklist available on there, but the vouchers that prove that that plant occurs on the peninsula are also available at high resolution. So for example, you have Adiantum porietii, and you can see the number right here. We have digitized this accession number, this specimen, and it is available online for you to blow up and look at more closely. Um, for example, you can look at the genus Chylanthes or Myriopterus or the genus Opuntia and see everything that's there. One of the best examples of that is actually um, being able to use what we call our synoptic collection, the Collection Synoptica. Uh, which you can put the name of a genus like Castaleja, and you can see cada taxones de adentro esta género. And it's possible to have a specimen de cada nombre that, that supposedly is here in the peninsula. Um, and those are all scanned and available to you. So they're scanned to the degree that you can add, here's a herbarium specimen, you can blow it up, that you can actually zoom in as close on that specimen to count the number of ovules if you really wanted to, or the number of stigmatic lobes that are there. So that's a pretty high resolution for anyone to uh, be using, and they are available to you. We, in fact, just finished this for all of Baja California. Now, not only that, but if you wanna see a type specimen, so those are, a specimen so uh, uh, correlated, I should say, that are connected with the nomenclatura. Um, tenemos también, nuestra barrio está aquí uh, en línea también. So you can see every type specimen like the Dudleys and you can zoom in close to those as well. Now, you, so you, what our hope is, is that you can use the photos that are there, the specimen scans, and then you can even take that a step farther. So here's an example of an endemic genus. This is Culturella capitata. It is in the Asteraceae. Um, you can see online, you would find on Baja Flora, habit shots, fruit shots, flower shots, specimen scans, and distribution of the plant. So that gives you a lot of knowledge about every single plant that we know to occur on the peninsula. And the problem is, that was published in 2016, but we are constantly finding new things, naming and describing new species, and people are finding new records. Here's a good example. This is Cascuta sorathamnensis. It was recently described from the US in Anza Borrego, but uh, Sule and I were working along the border and happened to find this plant, um, this parasito, 
and it only grows on Sorathamnus shati, and it was just south of the border in Baja California. So we know that it does occur in Baja California. Um, a few years ago, I described seven new cacti for the peninsula, and those are the information is is available in the checklist at this point. But uh, you wouldn't find it in like Wiggins flora from 1980 or something like that. Examples are Puntia clarkiorum. That's what it looks like in the field. It's a beautiful species of prickly pear. Or uh, Cylindropuntia libertarensis. It's Unchoya muy, muy restringida de solamente decir de la libertad en la parte central de la península. And solamente en una cañón uh, muy profundo en, el, en parte de esta uh, sierra también. Um, hay otros son más uh, nuevos y nosotros describimos recientemente. Por ejemplo, esta es Astragalus comenduensis, está cerca de uh, Tucumandú, eh, solo en un lugar donde hay una laguna, una laguna seca en, en parte del año. También una especie nueva de Caliandra, una, uh, I, I can't think of the name off the top of my head, sorry. Um, uh, in Spanish, but uh, it is, this is not the picture of it. This is Caliandra californica, but this one is also a red species, but this species is restricted to the Sierra de Guadalupe. Um, and más recientemente envió esta publicación con Dr. Mike Simpson, un especialista en el género Cryptantha, and this is una especie nueva solamente de the dunas de El Socorro y San Quentin. Uh, se llama Cryptantha aranophila. It has now been accepted for publication. It should be out in the very near future, but it is a dune endemic just to this uh, area. Other species that are not yet named, but so this is just adding to our flora. We have lots of things yet to describe and we're finding new things here on the peninsula. There is a new delphinium. For example, delphinium perii is extremely rare in Baja California and in the what the problem is, is that what is common is a new species. And that species is common in Baja California, but it actually comes up and just barely crosses into the US in San Diego County in this area. But it really looks a lot like Perii, but yet it's different. So that's one that's being described right now. The problem with all of this diversity is we have a lot of threats. Uh, the biggest threat is loss of habitat, and that can be due to agriculture or to urbanization. Um, but then what is protected, we also see major degradation of that habitat. Um, things are being contaminated or um, people are hiking there too often or running their motorcycles or dune buggies over the areas. And then we also have competition with uh, the non-native plants and the non-native plants are increasing on the peninsula, which is a constant threat to the native flora. Then you get into areas like fragmentation of the natural communities. So for example, in Ensenada, you have now areas of canyons that are separated by housing. So you have a natural canyon and then you have some housing. We don't understand if those plants will be able to reproduce well with the spe same species in another canyon. Can they disperse their seeds and their pollen, et cetera? Um, and then um, there's always changes in the uh, uh, fire uh, cycles. It has increased these days. It's much greater than it ever was in, in history. And that causes an influence on the native species. We say, well, that's not a problem in areas like Chaparrales, but it is because the incendios son disturbios. No, they're, they're, it's a natural disturbance. And that causes non-natives to actually get a foothold in those natural habitats after a fire. And that can cause competition, more competition with the native species that are in those regions. And the last is our lack of knowledge, basically, of the flora. So we don't know everything about the flora. We're still learning a lot more about the entire flora of Baja California. And that is a threat, because if we knew everything, we could protect it. We'd have been in much better shape, but we have a long race to go. Now, I'm at the uh, um, El Museo de Historia Natural in San Diego, and we have been, we have collections dating back to the 1870s. 
We have about 9 million scientific uh, specimens in all of these uh, multidisciplinary uh, fields in all these different departments. Um, but for plants specifically, we have what's called the SD uh, herbarium. And adentro herbarium, I mas o menos uh, 270 or 80 miles de specimens desde ayer hasta como de 1870. Um, so it's a very old collection and we have a very, very strong collection for Baja California. Um, and um, not only is our information available on Baja Flora, but also we run a consortium of information from UABC, uh, from the Colección de Herbario en UABC en Ensenada, and también en Sibnor in La Paz. Ellos tienen un radio allí. So it's possible uh, uh, to search for uh, specimens de todos estos herbarios aquí en esta uh, área. Now, I brought up the San Diego County Plant Atlas because there's a lot of resources on sdplantatlas.org as well. Many of these, if you are working in the noroeste de Baja California, cerca de frontera, la mayoría de las uh, um, recursos allí van a, ustedes pueden usar and hopefully they will benefit you um, as well. And uh, um, for example, we have mapped out, here's a, a lot of work of specimens of creosote bush, the gubernadora in uh, the Contado de San Diego. And it's possible to uh, use map, uh, mapeos, no? Diferentes um, de, de algunas especies. So not just, you can use one species, you can use two species, you can use many species. And I just bring this up because there are some resources that are on the Plant Atlas website that I think you would find to be useful uh, for Northern Baja as well. All the way down to, you can look where a specimen has been collected along a trail. Now this also goes for Baja California. So the Plant Atlas website has, and the iNaturalist project called the San Diego County Plant Atlas uh, project is really going strong. And if you see, uh, there are, over 441,000 observations of plants just within the county of San Diego. So people are using it heavily and we are using that data. I am verifying the specimens there and we're using it. For example, for Gubernadora uh, in the uh, Desierto de Anza Varego, you can see that the green specimens here are, um, spe are actual specimens but the red are all of the observations that I have personally verified. So once I verify the specimens, we bring them into a joint database and we can map them out side by side. And as a result, our knowledge is so much greater for the flora and on a smaller scale than what the specimens gave us in the past. Here's an example of a rare species, Xyloriza or Cutii. You can see we had um, let me see if I can get my mouse here. One specimen in this area, but some of the researchers on uh, naturalists have been walking along the canyons, mapping out every single individual of that uh, species in those canyons. So it gives us a lot more data for about this very rare species. Um, also, I information taxonomico. For example, Cuando hay muchos especímenes y muchas observaciones de naturaleza verificadas, es posible ponerlas y entender la distribución más fina de cualquier taxón. Por ejemplo, los subespecies de Stephanomeria exigua. Um, you can see where they have a definite break right along the mountain areas here. And if you are in this area, oops, uh, let's see, over here, you would only be dealing with one subspecies versus a different subspecies here. So there's a lot of information that can be gained. Another thing that can be helpful to you is that cada mes hay información sobre educación de las plantas de ese contado, pero esta sirve también para el norte de Baja California. Por ejemplo, los variedades de Corizante y Fimbriata. Um, 
cómo es posible uh, distinguir estas uh, variedades. Por ejemplo, aquí es, es variedad fimbriata y de otra es variedad laciniata. So, um, every month we have information about these and how you separate it, what you look for, and how you can improve your understanding of the flora. So I do recommend that you check out these. They're available to anyone. You can join that project or and look at month by month to look at that, or you can just go on and look on it. You don't have to actually have joined the project, including Los uh, uh, Ceracarpus. I know this is difícil para alguna gente en Baja California también. Hay una Ceracarpus metalianos con uh, tricomas muy largos y cortos también, pero Ellos no tienen un glándulo muy grande. Uh, en de otra es Ceracarpus fusilis. Uh, eso es más común en Baja California. But hay, hay variación de esta especie también en la península, pero tienes un glándulo muy uh, grande en cada tricoma. We're also building some other resources for people uh, where we're going a step further and we're doing measurements of uh, specimens and those photo uh, references will be available um, before too long. So keep an eye open for both the Plant Alice and in Baja California on our websites to get a lot of this stuff. For example, los dos de estas especies son en Baja California también, es de género glinos. And it's in the Melugenesi, es una maleza, pero es muy común cerca de um, uh, charcoles or cualquier uh, lagos or, or and, and al menos en el norte. But the difference is that uh, this species, if you use the key, seeds tubercled. And if you take a photo, you may not be able to see that. But you can see the tubercles on the actual samias here versus the other species, you can see it has a very smooth um, look to the seed. And there are some other slight differences on the tips of the calices, but um, much harder to see in just regular photos, you have to know what you're looking for. So we're trying to build those resources for everyone as well. Another book that will be coming out soon are the ferns of San Diego County, but almost all of these ferns also occur over the border in Baja California. For example, Myriopteris peri, Myriopteris visida. How you would tell those apart, we will have the key characters showing the the differences of those in the photographic plate. Or the Lycophytas, the Selaginella aromophila in this case, um, or Selaginella asprella, which also is in Baja California in the Sierra San Pedro Martir, or here you can see it running the desert's edge for aromophila. Um, now, for yourselves, here is what's gonna be the most helpful in that you can get lists of plants from Baja Fort Flora. So this is for San Diego County and we have it by ecoregion. We have not done that for uh, uh, California yet. But that's probably gonna happen in the near future. However, we do have checklists already available. For example, if you're gonna go up to the Sierra de San Pedro Martir, you can actually see the checklist and download a copy of that onto your phone or print it out before you go there. So you at least have an idea of all the species that are in that particular region or every island, uh, pretty much of both on the Gulf, many of them, but especially the Pacific Islands, we have put together and you just select the island that you would like here and it will give you a list. You can download it onto your phone or into Excel or whatever it may be. So these are tools uh, that you can take with you if you're gonna go visit an island or go to a mountain range. And we'll be constantly adding more lists like this to Baja Flora. But the best thing is this method. And if you are going to the San Quentin area, for example, and you wanna know what plants you might encounter, you can draw a polygon on Baja Flora, a polygono, and it's possible to tener toda la información de specimens uh, colectados en esta área, pero también the uh, todos los observaciones de iNaturalist verificados por, by myself. And so you can get a checklist of all of those things for any region of the peninsula. And I highly recommend that if you're going to do any iNaturalist in different parts, take a list with you because your chances of identifying are much, much higher. 
Now, we also have a ton of photos available on Baja Flora. I think this is an old number. We're probably oh, más de 40 miles de fotos de plantas y paisajes con plantas um, en, en esta región. En, algunos son muy viejos, ¿no? Al, hasta the 1930s. Um, and here's an example. If you know Echinocerius lindsayi, it's a very rare cactus. Um, and we have pictures of not only that species, but that species with George Lindsay um, so that it was named after. So there's a lot of resources and photos for you online as well. And for every one of these species, for example, you can put in some, the nombre Cilindro Pontiachoya. Hay más que 140 fotos de esta especie, solamente esta especie, con the habitat, the, uh, the frutas, the flores, de cualquiera. De, hay mucha varias en, en esta especie, es endémica de toda la, toda la península. Um, pero es posible ver dónde estuvo esta foto, uh, the, the fecha, quién sacó esta uh, foto también. Um, so what you can do also is map. You can map out any species that you want. And we have lots of different ways to map that out. For example, Malosma lorina. Uh, Lentisco. Malosma goes all the way from, from Tijuana to the Cape region. It's in the mountains in the Sierra de la Laguna. So you can see the specimens that are there. You can put it on Google Maps. You can actually cross-link not only the specimens, but the verified iNaturalist or Naturalista observations as well. And all this is available on Baja Flora. Um, or you can take two species. You want to see the difference between where is um, uh, Rusovada and Rus integrifolia. Son un poco parecidos, pero uh, there's casi no hay um, overlap of the species. They are very separate, although they do hybridize in a couple of areas on the peninsula as well. So if you're in Chaparral, pretty much you would know, or higher elevation, you would know you're in Risovada. If you're along the coast, you have Ris integrifolia. Um, this is the thing I use the most. This is the página de Baja Flora that I estoy usando cada día, bueno, muchas veces cada día. And this is where it, you have the checklist of the plants, but you select a plant family. And if you know the family of the plant, like the Asteraceae, It'll give you every single Asteraceae that we know to occur on the peninsula. And you can link to the specimen scan. You can see if we have photos, you can check the collection and you can map the species. And that is a really nice tool, everything in one place. And I, I think that's a really important uh, page that is on Baja Flora. And like I said, if you know the plants relatively well, this is something you really might want to use. Now, what are we doing with iNaturalist? And that is we are trying to integrate the specimen data that we have with the verified observations. I'm gonna tell you why verified is very important in just a little bit. But what does that mean in respect to the flora? Well, we have for Baja California and, and Nuestra Herbario uh, about 54,000 specimens um, of scientific specimens from the peninsula of Baja California. In INAT right now, they have almost the same amount of, of observations, but actually verified, and this is because I put this number and this is, it takes us a little lag time as I'm identifying things, but we're almost 70,000 have been verified by myself. Once they are verified, uh, the iNaturalist observations, because the specimens are already verified, then we pull those together into a database, and now we have over 100,000 uh, basically dots on a map of these things. And so every thing that I have identified of one of you that's in the field, once I identify that, we pull the information into Baja Flora and we can map them together. It gives us a lot more information about the flora. The problem with that is specimens collected and observations. If you look at the list of the top five, they don't even connect whatsoever. So basically, 
both of those things are not telling us what's most common throughout the entire peninsula or in Baja California. Sometimes it's what's easiest to photograph, like the Cardone with a wide distribution, or something very common that occurs outside of the urban areas, like Ariaganum fasciculatum. So we have to be aware of that when we're looking at both of these sources of data in trying to understand the distribution of these things. But, for example, with the Cardone, you get an idea of the distribution. We have I think in this case, I can't see my map here, but I think the red are specimens and the green are observations of Cardone throughout the entire region. Uh, so there's a lot more information that we're getting from observations to help fill in the gaps of our knowledge of these species. What have you done already? Some major things. Uh, you guys are doing a great job, uh, but we can do a little bit better, I think, with these. For example, and I know some of the people are on here tonight. Uh, this one is from Eric Melling. Um, he added a new species record to the peninsula. And this is, unfortunately, this is a non-native. It can be invasive and I hope somebody might wipe it out, <laughs> but he did collect this Perchera annua uh, in this area, which was the first record for this uh, region. It might actually be the first record for all of Mexico. I haven't looked to see it anywhere else. Um, Mariana, I think, is on tonight, and she has recorded new rare plant locations, things like Monardella stoniana. Um, you can see we had specimens here in this area near Otai, and we had some specimens down here, but we had no idea there were any populations in between. So she found a population right here. Um, here is Christiane Melling, also has added rare plant observations. Here's Nolina interrata. So we knew it, we know it well from San Diego. Um, it is, uh, let's see if I can get this one here. We know it's up here across the border. There has been some historic collections down through here. They have added new information as far as observations in brand new areas. We didn't know that this rare species occurred in. The other thing that's important are not just the rare species, but a, a very invasive species like Ditrichia graviolens. This species is a, a problem muy grande para nosotros en el condado de San Diego. Es una invasora uh, muy mal en nuestra región, en nuestro condado, pero también está ahora en el norte de Baja California. Uh, por ejemplo, hay solamente un espécimen científico de esta en Baja California, pero hay 11 observaciones de AINA. So, it gives us much information sobre the, the spread of this invasive species on the landscape. And if there are people interested in getting rid of this, then they know where to go looking for it to try and stop it from spreading throughout the entire areas of Baja California. Um, just some examples of, of our specimen knowledge and our observation knowledge. Here is the Pasto Anual Lamarquia Aria. Uh, here is uh, a common, very showy annual, Eschersotia amapola. This is uh, um, uh, Eschersotia californica. You can see that one of the things, if you notice here, there's a lot of specimens around uh, the urban areas of Ensenada, Tijuana. You guys are doing a major, a really nice job in that area. But look how the species goes down into the central desert and we have no observations yet in these particular areas. Uh, the same with Gallium angustifolium. It is, we have good observations near the urban centers, but you go up into the mountains, it is widespread in this part of the peninsula, almost no observations on Nephilista. Uh, a little bit better with some of our succulents. These succulents, cacti, las cactáceas son buenísimo para uh, sacar fotos, no? Es muy fácil uh, identificar también. Uh, por ejemplo, uh, hay muchas más observaciones que especímenes en, en estos grupos. Por ejemplo, Ferracactus ecantoris, o Cylindracis, o una cinnamon. Um, también Mammillaria daoica. You can see there's más de uh, 700 um, uh, observaciones, porque es muy amplio esta distribución de, de estas uh, suculentas de la península. Algunos de invasores también, por ejemplo, Sacate Buffel. Um, hay algunos ejemplares científicos y de más observaciones uh, uh, 
uh, showing basically the gaps that we're getting this. And this thing is spreading significantly on the peninsula. Now, it's no es solamente the, este proyecto de the Florida de Baja California, pero también estoy en cargo de un otra, dos proyectos, the, the San Diego County Plant Atlas Project and also the Imperial County Plant Atlas Project. So, eh, están en estas regiones, por favor, sacas fotos y poner dentro de estos proyectos de iNaturalist. Now, there are problems with research grade, and I don't know, maybe Jorge can help me with this, but I'm not sure what research grade, if it's grado investigación, I know, no sé seguro, um, pero de observaciones de research grade, hay un problema. Uh, and this is porque estamos solamente usando de uh, mis identificaciones, mis verificaciones. Um, por ejemplo, esta es la especie Chlorogallum pomeridianum, usando research grade and iNaturalist in the Contado de Baja de San Diego. Pero en actualidad, es solamente en la parte no, norte de nuestro contado. So, ¿Por qué hay muchas otras en esta parte? Es porque es, hay confusión con esta con otra especie se llama Chlorogallum parvifolium. And so, this is a problem con research grade. Just because more than one person has identified it does not mean that it is correct. So this is why I only use what I identify, and that's what we pull into the, uh, the, the base de datos de, para nuestro proyecto. And um, I know that I make mistakes, but hopefully there are not very many of them. I'm definitely not perfect, uh, but I do know the floor pretty well in, in these, these areas. So that's why we use just my verified one. Um, now for Baja California, just to give you an idea, in this project, there are a little over 117,000 observations and uh, you guys are doing amazingly well. And I just want to compliment Christian Melling, uh, Eric Melling, as far as there's Bill uh, as well down in the Southern part, Vinshite. These are all major contributors to this project. So they are putting lots and lots of observations and helping us better our knowledge of the flora. So thank you guys very much for doing that. And I hope that all of you will continue uh, to do this. However, and I know that we have a handout for this that will be sent out to you after this talk. I don't think it's arrived to you yet. It'll be in your Correo Electronico, um, but it tells you how to join the project. And that is essential that you join the project and you give the curator access to your coordinates. And you'd say, well, why would I need to do that? Because John's already identifying uh, my observations. Well, very soon they have just created a new function on iNaturalist where I'm only going to identify those observations where I have access to the coordinates of that so that I get something for it and that scientifically we get something for it. And so if you have not given me access here as far as your coordinates, then we throw out that information. We do not use it in the database because there's no way for me to get it. You have to join the project and to do this. Now that's only, you, you do that for the whole project, but it only really is more important for those species that are listed. So como the species in the norma oficial. The, la mayoría de las especies y observación no es un problema uh, porque yo puedo obtener the, the, the coordenados de, de cada observación. So now we come to how to make this better. What do you guys need to do? And I can tell you for almost everyone working on Baja Flora, we need more photos, more photo, más fotos. And here's what you want to try and do. Take a picture of the entire plant. Um, so the habit of the plant. Take a picture of the flower from above. Take a picture of the flower from the side. If it has fruits, take a picture. And this is a very important thing. Do both surfaces of the leaves. And so we have created for you a guide that will also be sent out to you that tells you exactly how to do this not only in general like this, but for specific plant groups like families and some genera. And we've created that for you. It'll say, oh, with the con el género de astragalus, es necesario tener los dos, los dos flores y frutas. 
es necesario para identificar porque hay una diversidad de endémica y muy difícil de identificar en este grupo. Y por eso hay información sobre este archivo que vamos a enviar. Uh, the other thing that's really important is to put scale in there. So if you look at the photo here in the upper left, you say, well, that's solanum, but I really can't tell what that is. But if you put your fingers in the photo, you can see the length of the anthers is very significant. So the short one is solanum americanum. You can see a much larger one is solanum de glacia. They're both white flowered or sometimes a little purplish, but I have to be able to tell how long the anthers are. So if you put your fingers or if you have a ruler or a scale of some sort, that gives us that information. I usually use my fingers because I do these things very quickly in the field. The other thing is it's very important to have reproductive material. So if you look at the plants here, you'd say, well, it's a datura. This is seguro, pero es vegetativa. So a veces no es posible identificar sin flores, frutas, semillas. So if you look at datura without any reproductive, we really can't tell. But here, datura ridei, it has a clear throat. This color has purple colorations in it. This color has ribs on the calyx versus um, in ridei, it is smooth. This color has black seeds and ridei has tan seeds. And so all of these are differences and you need to get one of those when you're making observations so that we can tell what the species are between those. Or flowers and fruits of something like Cremaria. Take pictures of the flowers. For example, the flowers and the petals of Cremaria. So the sepalos son uh, uh, atrás aquí en, en los dos. Son the petalos están aquí y aquí también. Esos son glandulos, pero es, es parte de petalos. And this, for example, Cremaria erecta, all of these flag petals fuse into one structure, but in bicolor, each one of them is separate. The fruits are really different. In erecta, if you've got a fruit, you can see the retorse barbs going all the way down the fruit, but in bicolor, they're only at the tip. There's one set of like grappling hooks at the tip. And so you need to have not just the habit of the plant, we need to see a close up of the flower or the fruit or both or whatever you would like. Um, helechos, hay muchas especies de este género de pentagrama, está muy diverso, es, es el centro de diversidad de pentagrama en el condado de San Diego, también en el norte de Baja California. Por ejemplo, pentagrama glandula vicia es una especie nueva de mm, como cinco años en el pasado, uh, alguien describió. Pero la diferencia de cada es necesario tener los dos lados de, de hojas, ¿no? the, the fronds. So you need to see, is it white on the underside or is it yellow? And then the upper surface, we also need to see. And then if you can take a close up, you can see that there are little glands here, little capitate glands on the surface of, of glandula viscida. And here's the distribution of it. But the whole leaf is really important. Notice this lobe here and the way these are lobed. And I want you to look at that compared to this one. Another white one that occurs right alongside glandula viscida is pentagramma viscosa. And it has entire margins. It is white, but you would also find it's really sticky on the upper surface. It doesn't have a capitate glands. Whereas pentagramma triangularis is yellow or green on the underside and it will have nothing on the upper surface. So you need to take both sides of the pentagrammas when you're making a photograph. One of the biggest groups that we don't know enough about for iNaturalists are the pastos, the sacates. And here's what you should do for every grass that you can. Take a habit shot. Take a, put your hand in and get the inflorescence. Take a shot showing the node if you can. And some then you have to actually look at the caryopsis in this case um, and look at the hairs, if you can show it that close. They're beautiful species. Look at the flowers on here. They actually can be quite attractive. And I think I have a close up. These are all grasses. They're really attractive if you learn to take photos of them well. And so we need part of the inflorescence branches like this, the spikelets. You wanna take some of the stems. These are the sheaths. 
Um, and there, there's a ligule on the inside if you're doing some microscopy. And these are the nodes here. All of that are kind of important in identifying. The grasses are our second most diverse family in toda la peninsula. So it's the segunda uh, más, the familia más diversa de toda la peninsula. Es necesario tener más fotos de este grupo. También los uh, manzanitas. Hay 21 tipos de, de arctostaphylos in, in Baja California. Um, es muy diverso. And the most important is, bueno, if si es posible, es posible haber the nascent inflorescence uh, antes flores. But the most important, and I don't know how to say this in Spanish, is the burl. Um, it's, it's parte de, de tallo más, um, más abajo, cerca del suelo. And this is what it looks like. So this is a burl of a manzanita, if it has one. This is a species that does not have one. You need to take pictures of that because what that's designed for is that it sprouts back. That same individual can sprout back after a fire. That's what we call a burl. To identify manzanitas, you have to know, is there a burl or is there not? Then the flowers are not so important in manzanitas, but the fruits are. So whether they're depressed or whether they're very large and glandular, if you have an inflorescence and you can see glandular hairs can be important, but also a side view of the stem showing the types of hairs that are there or the lack thereof. And those are what we need for manzanitas. Um, encinos. Hay muchas especies de encinos también en la península. Um, es posible a, a tener fotos de bellotas, the acorns. Those can be very important in our understanding. Of course, the leaves, but also on both sides of the, of the leaf. So whether it is, we have two varieties of agrifolia, whether there's little hair or a lot of hair. Um, and also the trunk can be, or the habit and the trunk can be really important for this, this species. So in short, what it comes down to is take photos. They're very attractive. They're, they're like art if you really get into the photos. So photos, photos, take more photos. Memory is cheaper these days. You should be able to take lots of photos for every single observation. And that basically improves our chance to get an accurate identification. There are some groups that photos will not do it. For example, the genus Matricaria and the Asteraceae. We have two species on the peninsula. Um, one of them is native, one of them is questionably native, um, the Matricaria um, discoidea, but they look identical. So the only difference is you have to look at the achenes and see if they're entire or low. So that's a very difficult thing to do, but realize just a shot of the plant, we can't tell you what it is. Or you get into Cryptantha or Plagiobathres, and it gets much more difficult. These are just not very conducive for identification. It, there's sometimes you can see the characters, but the far majority of the time, it's not possible to ID them without actually seeing these nutlets. Uh, and there are a lot of them. Cacti, on the other hand, are very, very easy. Take pictures. And there are a lot, we have a huge diversity of cacti on the peninsula, over 70% endemism. Uh, all of these are different pollination syndromes, you can see, or just the habits. They're very easy for iNaturalists, and they give us a lot of information because specimens are very difficult to make for these uh, cacti. I always say it's a painful, bloody experience to make a cactus specimen, but they actually make nice ones. But what you need to realize is that we're learning a lot from your photos. So we're also learning in science that Cacti are not as easy as we thought. There is a lot of reproductive biology going on, and there are a lot of different sexes. For example, the cardone, we found out a few years ago, actually is trioecious, and so is this endemic species in the top of the Sierra San Pedro Martir, the Kinosirius mambergerianus, and it is, has three different sexual conditions. You can see hermaphrodites, here's a, an hembra, and here's a macho. So take photos of these and it helps us to understand that. Or the gynodioecious things like Mammillaria dioica. 
Um, and some new information, Cylinder Plenty of Wolfii is mostly in the Contado de Imperial y San Diego, pero también es, es cerca de frontera en in, the norte de Baja California. And we have found, we thought it was a gynodiaceous species, but uh, some people have been doing some great work, uh, Dr. Yuvia Flores at San Diego State, and she has found that it is functionally dioecious. So even though we couldn't tell that from photos, this still gives us a lot of information. The more pictures of photos you can get, it gives us more information on reproductive biology. One that's endemic to Baja that we think is gynodioecious, Cylindro puntia san felipensis. Now it also might be functionally dioecious. So if you're over in the Desierto de San Felipe, por favor saque fotos de esta especie también. Uh, be observant. There are lots of species that are not so easy to see out there. One of the rare ones, this is an endoparasite, una parasito that is the adentro. La mayoría de esta planta is the adentro, una huésped. Uh, se llama Pilostylis thurberi. And you have to see it at the right time of the year on the lower part of the stems. But you would find it, in fact, we've documented it over in the Desierto de San Felipe. Um, other things to look for, extra floral nectaries in, can in cacti. These are uh, una modificación de espinas con un glandula, and muchos insectos están usando estas en, en cactáceas en, en uh, maneras diferentes. Uh, por ejemplo, here's in, in garambullo, lofosirius, in ferrocactus, in cylindro pontia, et cetera, et cetera. Other parasitos, uh, it's necessary to have the photos de flores. For example, aquí is the cascuta subinclusa y cascuta californica. If you have just the stems, we can't tell what it is. But if you have the flowers, and then on top of that, if you have a parasite, always show the host plant. Whether you put it in your notes or you take a picture of the of the the parasito with the host, that is very important. And that can identify what we're dealing with in like the genus, the Cochis de Foridendra. Some areas that you should go looking for, things like go near the border. If you wanna add new species to the peninsula, example is Acmaspon Haydeni. Sula and I found the first record basically in Baja California, just south of the border um, over by, at the bottom of La Rumorosa. Um, also, if you've had a fire recently, go into the area because there are a lot of fire followers that come up and document them while we can, because that will change as the chaparral starts to grow back, all of those annual or short-lived perennials will go away. A project we're working on right now is with Picaringia montana, and we want to know what's happening with this species. So if you take pictures of it, try to see Hay frutas de esa especie en una población. ¿Y qué tipo de tricomas están en uh, hojas y detalles de, de esta especie en campo también? There are lost species of Baja. This is the reason we're actually doing this, is this project uh, on the lost species of Baja got us the money for doing this training. Things like Astragalus piscinus was only known from 1889. We found it actually near Jesus Maria, now, sur de the estado de California, uh, very common in one place. We found all of these, but there are still so many things to rediscover that you guys could find out there. And I think we're going to be putting together this list of lost things, and you can try and go to these things, to these areas, and better document. There are still some, like this Spinophilus, which was collected once in 1886 in San Ramon. And also at that same time in 1886 in Tijuana. It was just recently rediscovered in San Diego, the very first time in the US. So we have one population, that is it, of this species. It is very likely in Baja California if we're looking in areas where acanthomintha or some of the clay soils occur on the peninsula. Um, here's one that is completely lost right now. Uh, I couldn't find it. I've looked multiple times with Dr. Jose Lerdiadillo and others. And this is Poliomintha conjunctrix. It's a red flowered uh, shrub. It would be kind of near on the, the Llano de Buenos Aires, uh, 
I've looked and looked in this area. I guarantee there's a population somewhere. We just have not found it. But if you have an interest and you want to go on a field trip, go looking for a species like this in those areas. What about algas, líquenes, and hongos y todo? Bueno, no mucha información, pero por favor, uh, sacas fotos y observaciones de esas porque no tenemos listas muy amplias de, la, de estos tipos de especies. Que yo no puedo identificar porque no es mi especialidad, pero alguien puede ayudar en, en la lista. Uh, so, por ejemplo, líquenes o algas. Hay algunos recursos de nuestro herbario en Baja Flora también. Hay uh, escaños de, de specimens de, de macroalgae. Uh, and they're fantastic to look like uh, to look at, and they're almost like artwork. With that, that's all I have, and I think we're going to open it up to questions. I apologize. I do want to say that um, you know my intent for this project and this training was to be in person. We are going to do that. I really hope that the museum and the National Geographic Society will let us do that in the future. So I hope to see all of you in the field one day. We'll get Jorge, Annie, and Sula, and we'll all come down and we'll do some field trips together and work on improving our, our techniques in the field. So with that, I am going to finish. Uh, thank you for your attention. And we will take some questions if we have some. So I'll let Sula and Jorge and Annie address anything that needs to be right now from the chat. Muchas gracias, Juan. Por nada. <laughs> Excelente presentación. <laughs> so, um, we do have a couple of questions that came in through the chat. Um, can you define gynodioecious? Hmm. That's a good question. And I don't know how to say it. Is it gynodioca? Tal, tal vez no sé seguro en español. Pero um, yo creo es gynodioca. Pero um, gynodioecious means that in a population, is mejor en, bueno, en un población hay algunos individuos son hermafroditas, son con los dos sexos uh, funcionales y de otros in, individuos solamente hembras. So hembras y hermafroditos en la, la misma población. So, pero no machos. What's that? No machos. No con hino de yuca. Pero prioica o traices uh, hay uh, tres condiciones sexuales. Por ejemplo, de cardón tiene eso y también y conocidos mamburgerianas. Tal vez a, la, a otras cosas también, pero um, al menos en este momento solamente estos dos en esta área. Pues, sí, solo quiero comentar, todos están eh, bienvenidos a poner preguntas en el chat también, si quieren prender sus cámaras, si, si quieren platicar con John, hoy es el momento, adelante, por favor, si quieren oh, saludar. Um, I, I have another question for you, John. Yeah. Um, specifically, if you're using iNaturalist, I know no todos tenemos un teléfono con un GPS excelente y a veces los puntos están equivocados o batallamos para tomar un punto súper preciso cuando estamos haciendo registros de naturalista. ¿Tienes algún consejo o qué nos recomendaría? Sí, bueno, lo más importante es uh, después usando o sacando fotos, están usando la aplicación y directamente, then va a... Uh, if you're going to upload the photos later, is you have to be very careful that it doesn't recognize the place that you're uploading. It shouldn't do that because it actually takes the metadata from the photos in the field. However, um, the más importante is después the información is in adentro a naturalista. Por favor, checkes la localidad de si es correcto. It's possible uh, uh, to edit the locality and you can move it wherever you want after it's uploaded. But I have to tell you for myself, I only use my phone and, and I use it in the application of iNaturalist or Naturalista, and I rarely have any problems whatsoever. There are occasional and every time I upload, I check the localities to make sure they're in the right place. So does that work? Yeah, thanks, John. So there's there's questions starting to pour in now. And I have to say there's also a lot of chat. Everybody wants to tattoo a finger 
with a scale bar. And I have a feeling you know someone who's done this. I am do I know right? I am not that person, <laughs> but I do know someone who has done that. <laughs> Pero estás a favor, todos deben de tatuarse con una escala en el dedo. <laughs> <laughs> you, <laughs> or a marker. <laughs> ah, that's a better idea. Antes de salir, no? So we have a question here from Carlos Velasco. Are the numbers that you shared already published, the ones showing Hibernian vouchers and iNaturalist records to show the value of iNaturalist and how much it's com contributing to our botanical knowledge? Well, I'm definitely giving Muchas pláticas con esa información. En español, por favor, Juanito. <laughs> Pero yo creo que no hay publicación exactamente con estos números, pero seguro están en mis pláticas. En el Parlamento es en algunas publicaciones sobre de, um, en conferencias o cualquiera. No sé, no sé seguro. Pero seguro está muy importante para nosotros a entender la distribución de las plantas. Otra pregunta, John. Um, Ale Peña está preguntando si encontramos una fruta o flor. If we find a fruit or flower, should we be cutting them in half? Los you don't have to do that. No, no es necesario. No, no es necesario hacer eso. There's, there's, I, I've never done that in the field. I actually cut through them. Um, if you really wanted to do it, that would be fine, but there's no real reason. No hay razón para cortar the, the flor. Normalmente de, de sacar una foto de arriba y de, de al lado es necesario a uh, uh, identificarla. So no es necesario acortar. Y es mal para la naturaleza también <laughs> acortar. So you're getting a stream of compliments that I'm not going to share because I don't want your head to get big. But Norma <laughs> Barcelona is, um, is also asking, What's the best time to take photos of the pastizales in Sierra San Pedro Marte of the grasslands? ¿Cuándo sería la mejor época? Ah, bueno, es, es posible sacar fotos ahí en dos tiempos del año, ¿no? Más o menos después de, más uh, temprano en el año, después de, cuando no más uh, uh, in English. <laughs> I'm having trouble here. <laughs> <You're okay. laughs> After the winter rains have come and it's gotten warm enough, there are some species that come up and they will be there for a while. Um, so say maybe April to May to June, then it kind of stops for a while until the summer rain, we get the uh, the influence of the summer rain or the buildup. You, if you go up there later in the year, you'll get this these massive thunderclouds that build up in the summer. They drop more water, and there are plants that then, then respond to that in the in the meadows up there as well. So you can get different things at different times of the year up there is what it comes down to. Of course, nothing really during the winter. When it's really, really cold, you're not going to find anything up at that elevation because of the snow. So there's a question here from Marua. I think it's a good question. I think you touched on this. She's saying, what do we do with the species that are protected and that automaticamente su ubicación está desplazada varios kilómetros? Yeah, um, so that is done on purpose. iNaturalist does that and for a good reason. That is protecting those resources to the general public. And this is where I'm saying that you need to, but. Myself, I'm very protective with the information. Of course, I have information on the specimens as well. We don't just give any of that information out there, but that's where I need all of you to join the project and give access to the curator to have those coordinates. Or actually, we can't use that in science if you have not done that because it is obscured and that information is lost to us in science at that moment. So it is, that's where, if you have a good scientific rationale to have that kind of coordinates of these rare species, that's where you should join a project and give the curator access to those. But uh, the, the rest of the stuff is not a problem, but it's those that are obscured. Did that answer the question? Hopefully. Yeah, I think so. I think so. So we have a, a question from Julia. And she says, acabo de registrarme en Naturalista, por fin. He visto que hay una foto por especimen, 
La pregunta es, de ser así, de todos modos, subo varias fotos de un mismo especímen, como acaba de explicar John. So, yes, John, right? Even though iNaturalist has made some change, where now it's a lot harder to upload multiple photos at one time, you want us to go back and, and keep adding multiple photos of each individual from different perspectives in every time, right? Okay, that there was a time period when they got... This was a couple of months ago. It was very difficult to do multiple photos. They've now changed it back. I don't know in the last few weeks if you've tried it. But um, you should, if you're using the application, you can do as many as you want. That just immediately in the field, pop, 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 pop. But if you're actually taking photos and then uploading them to the thing after the fact, which is fine, um, they have now made it again, so it is easier to do multiple photos. I, I, if there is a problem, that's something that we should talk to Jorge about because I know they changed it in the U.S. and it is like uh, Margie was complaining about it's it. It's not working for me. It's yeah. not working for you either. Mm -hmm. uh, it's something that we should be sending something to iNaturalist because we want okay. people to make no. multiple photos of every single observation to improve the chances. For the identification. So, okay. did you? It, yeah, I, and Carla's asking if there are plants that we should be careful for sharing the coordinates, but this is basically happening whether you want it to or not, correct? Entonces, ya ni tienes opción si tomas una foto de una planta protegida, las coordenadas uh, van a estar desplazadas. ¿Es cierto, Jorge o John? Well, it's, go ahead, Jorge. No, sí, 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 si la planta está, por ejemplo, bueno, aquí en México, si es una planta protegida que está en la norma oficial mexicana o, o, en, o en CITES o está también en, en la lista roja, automáticamente está oscurecida, ¿no? Pero bueno, en este caso, como dice John, o sea, bueno, eh, pues supongo que la mayoría que están aquí confían o, o conocen a John y bueno, en mi caso yo sé que John es, es un experto, es científico, y sabemos que si le damos acceso a esas coordenadas, pues lógicamente él no va a ir y saquear esas plantas. Él las va a usar para investigación y conservación. Entonces, en este caso, pues es lo que él les pide, ¿no? Si, si es una planta que está en la NOM y que automáticamente naturalista lo oscurece, ustedes pueden, mediante la opción que comenta John, poderle darle acceso a él exclusivamente al curador del proyecto, que sería John, para poder ver esas coordenadas, ¿no? O sea, nadie más las va a poder ver más que el que observó el, la, la planta, o en este caso, y John, ¿no? Entonces, yeah. es una manera de poder compartir. And let me add to that as well, because you have to realize that we are using that data. It's not just for distribution, but it's actually helping us a lot in conservation as well of these species. So, a good example is the Native Plant Society just did their important plant areas uh, for Baja California. So at least in the northern part, we used the verified uh, uh, database of observations of the rare plants as well, actually all the plants, but the rare ones included, to help us decide what areas in Baja California should we actually strive to protect. And so that data is being used for conservation as well. It's not given freely. It is, it is only for very specific projects that are conservation or uh, for research basically is what it is for. So please rest assured that it is protected with me. I'm not giving it out there uh, to everybody that, that we get that information. So John, Carla has a, another question that I think is um, particularly interesting. She says, in Naturalista, it's happened to me many times that I'm not getting any identifications if I upload cultivated species. Oh, great question. Um, because my projects actually throw out cultivated species. I don't even look at cultivated species. Entonces, so, si es una planta cultivada, ni la vas a ver? Yeah. I don't, I don't see them at all in my project. Other people might see them in wider projects, but I'm not interested in what's in a garden, I have to admit. <laughs> I, and now, if it leaves your garden and it goes into a natural area, then I am interested if it has escaped or naturalized, but not if it has been planted. That doesn't do us any good as far as uh, naturaleza. Abraham está preguntando qué lugares de Baja California Sur son los que necesitan más aporte de registros. 
y de qué grupos? So what, where do you need more data in Bahasa and from which groups? Everywhere. <laughs> no, let's be totally honest. Baja California, los dos estados son muy grandes, ¿no? Es, es una área muy amplio. I'm y... sorry, and I just saw that people are asking you to extend that for the whole peninsula. <laughs> Not just Bahasa, so yeah. Oh, and no, do that... you have priority areas where you have needs? No, no. I'm looking at everything that comes in on the entire peninsula and the adjacent islands. So my project runs all of those that are Baja California in the Gulf and the Pacific and the entire peninsula. So I am interested in all of the plants throughout there. But here's my suggestion. Like our collection records, it's always better to have more observations away from a road. <laughs> um, the farther away from a road, because you can actually, on our collection records, you can actually follow the highways because the way people have collected their specimens throughout the peninsula. So if you're gonna go on a hike or you're gonna do someplace, make observations away from a road. We need them along the road too, if you can't get out and hike. But if you're going to go camping or you're going to go hiking here, make lots of observations away. That gives us a lot more information uh, in areas that we know nothing about. So our friend Mariana is asking, what more tips do you have uh, in particular for el género Quercus? And to distinguish Quercus agrifolia, dumosa, berberidifolia, engolmanii, do you want bellotas y flores or um, and well, from both is, sides or and I also... need all of those things uh, bellotas are nice but uh, like domosa for example I don't know if you saw my picture there but I had a microscopic shot um, showing the underside of the leaf because it actually has hairs that go away from the leaf and only domosa does that and I, this is a good time to actually bring this up um, if you're so inclined and you have the financial uh, possibility to have it, there is something that I use with my phone. I take everything with my phone these days um, and I use this little Zenvo macro. And this is about, um, I think it's about $45 now on Amazon. So it, it's not a really expensive thing, but it's very, very nice to have because you can just clip it right onto your phone you get a macro shot to do close-ups of hairs and things like that. So um, it is a nice little thing. That's how I've done a lot of those close-ups uh, of showing glands and that kind of stuff is just with a little thing like this on my phone. Now, if you have a good macro lens and SLR, you can probably do the same uh, without those, but th that's a much more expensive uh, thing. So um, for the oaks, that's not an easy answer. I would have to go through each one and tell you the differences, but take pictures of both sides, take the habit, um, anything you can get, Mariana. It's a difficult group. Oaks are infamous for being taxonomically difficult. They also hybridize. Uh, so take what you can. <laughs> Sorry. Mariana, did you want to add anything to your question or is that? I know you had a multi-part. <laughs> okay. Should we take the time now to maybe open it up to actual questions? Um, if we've got some time without, do, you, do we want to keep it this way for a little bit or do you want to just open? There's about 12 more, but however you would like to do it is There's fine. about 12 more. What do you guys think? <laughs> <laughs> well, let's answer the important ones first then if there are, and then we'll open it up because some people may just want to ask it in person. So um, there's a couple of different questions here about Dudleyas and the best sources of information for Dudleyas and finding information, distinguishing hybrids. I know this isn't your favorite topic, but nah, Dudleyas, que dices you know, Some people don't do windows. I don't do Dudleyas, but the, uh, um, they are, Dudleyas are a problem. We do have, I can tell you online for photos and specimens, we have most everything you could want hybrids between them, et cetera, because my predecessor, Reed Moran, he, all of his, his uh, um, specimens and his photos are available on Baja Flora. And so you can actually see those hybrids between each one. Now, also, we have his field notes available online. So if you want to look up where he collected something and maybe he'll have a description. He was very meticulous in his field notes. 
you can look up that species or that date or whatever it may be and find out more by reading through his field notes. And he has amazing field notes. They're also fun because he kind of uh, tells lots of stories uh, on it. They are in English, but if you're really into Dudley, you would have to know that that work since his doctoral work was on the genus Dudley. But there is no other resource that's any good, to be honest, for the peninsula. Uh, just the checklist, what we have is the last uh, thing. There are new ones being named all the time though for, from our region. So I think John is, is a good idea to, to open it up and see si John no ha contestado tu pregunta ahora es la oportunidad de preguntarle en persona. Um, but one more question as people, if you want to turn your cameras on, si quieren frente las cameras y hablar con John. Mm -hmm. Aquí está John. Um, someone is asking what phone you use and mm. what phone you recommend. Well, I just got a new phone. So um, I bit the bullet and actually got an iPhone 12. But the... That is, before this, I was at iPhone 8, and that's what I used to do all the photography that I had with this. And um, this helps with anything that has a, a single lens. I will have to tell you with the iPhone 12, I have not figured out how to use this very well because it has the three lenses. And so um, it's a little more difficult to use a macro, but the iPhone 12 can do that. It has the resolution to be able to do an excellent job anyway. Um, but uh, yeah, that's that's what I have been using so far. Oh, look, there's Fernando. <laughs> Pio. Pio. <laughs> Hello, John. Hola. <laughs> I, I haven't I seen have you forever. Okay, so do we have some questions? I there, Pio is a major resource for for iNaturalist as well. He's a major contributor and also a good friend. <laughs> and he's been answering some of them for you in the chat. Oh, great. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> sí, yo, yo creo que, eh, retomando lo que dijo Carlos, que eres la persona adecuada para publicar eh, tus experiencias en Naturalista y compararlas con la visión de, de un investigador, porque tienes muchísimos datos de colecciones de mapas y cómo ha cambiado eh, con Naturalista la la calidad de los datos. Yeah. Viendo la charla, es lo, me, me, me surge que eso sería un tema muy interesante para que esté publicado y así motivar incluso a, a más científicos a, a unirse. Yeah. Sí, es. sí, es cierto. Es cierto. Bueno, sí, sí siento que muchos investigadores están empezando a publicar uh, usando observaciones de naturalista en lugar de especímenes, ¿no? He visto ciertos artículos en Acta Botánica, por ejemplo, y, y, y sí, nos acabamos de aceptar uno, ¿no? <ríe> pero pero creo, creo que sí, eh, ahí va la ciencia, la verdad. Sí, a, ahorita se utiliza mucho como complemento, ¿no? Este, personas que presentan un, un listado de un lugar, mencionan colecciones y aparte eh, observaciones de naturalista ¿no? como, como complemento. Pero lo, lo que presentó John de los mapas es impresionante. Alguna vez platicado con Poncho, eh, allí en, en el CIMNOT, de cómo eh, bu buscamos eh, especímenes de eh, estenoceros turberi. Uh -huh. Y de, había como dos o tres en toda la región del Cabo. Y uh -huh. es la de las especies más abundantes. Entonces, ahorita con naturalistas, pues ya, ya tienes el, el mapa bien, bien clarito. Sí. Es, es como eso estamos usando aquí en el condado de San Diego ahora. Es muy amplio la distribución con las observaciones ahora. Y, y tengo una pregunta que creo que podría ser más para Jorge y Ani. ¿Y ¿Hay esfuerzos de escuela para promover naturalista en las escuelas y con los niños en Baja California? Pues cada vez eh, hay un poco más de interés por medio de escuelas para pues para dar a conocer, digamos, la plataforma o que los alumnos lo utilicen, ¿no? En, en mi caso, yo como colaborador de Conavio, eh, pues he trabajado mucho con escuelas para dar talleres, ¿no? Eh, de naturaleza, de cómo usar la plataforma, hablarles un poco de qué es naturalista, cómo pueden apoyar a la ciencia con sus observaciones, con tomar una foto y subirla a naturalista, ¿no? De, de cualquier cosa que sea, ¿no? Ya sea planta, algún animal, alga, lo que sea. Eh, pero sí, eh, de algunos, por ejemplo, algunos colegas de aquí de Ensenada, por ejemplo, aquí está la maestra Al Almadelia, ella trabaja en el CEDMAR, y, y bueno, junto con el profesor Melling también, que él es uno de los, creo que es el que está en el 
primer lugar de observadores en naturalista y pues él es muy aficionado a las plantas entonces y conoce mucho sobre las plantas, ¿no? Entonces él también eh, a sus alumnos les, pues les, 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 les habla mucho de naturalista y los, los saca a observar, ¿no? Entonces creo que sí ha ido aumentando un poco más el interés, pero creo que falta todavía más, ¿no? Tal vez trabajar más con los profesores para que ellos aprendan a usar bien la plataforma y ellos ya trabajen con sus alumnos en alguna actividad enseñándoles cómo usar naturalista y tal vez sacándolos a alguna, algún lugar y, y que practicaran, ¿no? Pero sí ha aumentado un poquito. Bueno, por lo menos aquí en Ensenada, ¿no? Eh, no sé, habría que ver con algunos otros tutores de otros estados. En otros estados sí, ha, sí, yo, sí, sí esto ha pasado también, ¿no? Aquí en el grupo está Carlos Velasco. Yo creo Ajá. que es quien más conoce cómo, cómo se ha hecho la, la difusión y la promoción de, de Naturalista. No sé si Así ya es. se fue, si quiere cooperar algo. No, por ahí anda, ahí están. Eres de Monterrey. So. <risa> Primero que nada, John, muchísimas Hola. felicidades. Nunca había escuchado una de tus pláticas y fantástico. <risa> sí, este, muy, muy ilustrativo. Y, y lo que preguntas, Zula, sobre las escuelas, sí ocurre. Digo, yo sé que cada uno de los tutores trabaja en diferentes estados, por aquí anda Mar también. Este, y, y hay esfuerzos en regiones, por ejemplo, aquí en Nuevo León, este, por ejemplo, mi esposa que da, da clases en, en preparatoria también, les pide también a sus alumnos que hagan observaciones y que se integren en proyectos, pero pues es un proceso lento, gradual, que pues va avanzando, pero sí se fomenta mucho que se participen en las escuelas. Es, este, pues yo, digo, yo recuerdo que uno de los proyectos también de Ani hace un año, un año y medio, este, trabajaste con escuelas también allá de aquel lado, ¿no? Entonces, pues, pues ahí va pasito a pasito, pero sí, entre todos estamos empujando. <risa> Así que si hay algunos, muchos de los que aquí si dan clases en alguna escuela, pues hagan que sus alumnos se interesen más por naturalista y apoyen pues este tipo de proyectos, ¿no? Es que son muy importantes y dan a conocer mucho más sobre lo que tenemos, ¿no? Que nos rodea. Entonces, creo que es, que es bueno hacerlo. Y, y, hay, y hay varios comentarios en el chat de otros maestros que están eh, promoviendo naturalista con sus estudiantes de diferentes formas y Poncho también está comentando de su uso de naturalista. Pero yo en otra pregunta que nos llegó era um, si vas a mandar como un checklist de qué tipo de fotos debemos estar tomando y cómo. I didn't understand totally. Say that again. Uh, oh, so are you going to send us a checklist of all the different considerations and photos we should be taking? Like a sort yes. of a checklist of how to do this right? Yes. We, I don't think, Lauren, I don't think that uh, if she's on there has sent that yet. We actually have multiple things. There'll be about four files that are going to be sent to you. Some of them, Annie, thankfully, for, is translating a lot of those for us right now. We have a general guide is one of them that is that you can print out on your own that tells you how to actually take uh, photos and make observations for different disciplines, not just plants, but it goes for animals, insects, et cetera, et cetera. And so that comes out from the museum and that is in Spanish as well. Um, and when I actually come in person one of these days, I will actually hand those out. So it gives you kind of a quick guide uh, on how to do those things. The other one is specifically to Baja California and to San Diego County. It talks about the plant, each plant family, and what you should be taking photos of. Um, and then we're sending a little file that Annie's working on right now that says how to change those coordinates so that we can actually get that information from you on the species that are listed in one way or another. So there'll be a few things that are coming out uh, that kind of is a step-by-step -step guide for you to, for making plant observations. John, I remember that you told me once that you have a preference for what the first picture is. Oh, that's, I'm sorry, yeah. The, uh, the first picture, um, I, <laughs> For myself, but this is the problem is if you know the species and you know what differentiates that species from another one, I always prefer the very first photo to be that. And the reason for that is that when I'm doing massive identifications, I only look at one little thumbnail. <laughs> so I don't usually open up your observation to look at every single thing unless I can't tell from that thumbnail. So it, if you put a very distinctive thing up there as your first one, 
that's usually what I'm looking at when I'm doing identifications. And then if I can't tell, then I open up the observation. So that's what happens in the identification window. But you prefer generally a close up to a zoomed out. Yeah. A close up or something distinctive for that species, yeah. Bueno, yo no sé si hay más preguntas de la audiencia o... Well, John, I have one more question, just so everybody knows um, just how ill you are. How many iNaturalist observations <laughs> have you determined so far? We don't talk about my little addiction. <laughs> now, I think I'm about 340,000 identifications now for all the projects, but it is... Uh, uh, and I do my own observation. I love to go out in the field and do it as well on when I'm on projects or doing research in the field. I take a lot for myself as well for the area. But I try to take pictures of things that most people haven't, like grasses and things that we really need better documentation of. Um, but yes, as many of you know, I stay up late at night and I tend to do identifications late into the evening. And I will tell you that I often lay have a, a glass of wine with me. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I don't sleep a whole lot, so that's how I get a lot of that. <laughs> no, y recuerdo que en, al, en algún momento John, cuando eh, eh, Naturalista empezaba a, a agarrar auge, John como que no estaba muy convencido de, de usar Naturalista. Decía, no, como que no, que lo mejor es, pero y ahora vemos que ahora lo, dice que hasta ahora tiene adicción, ¿no? Por estar en Naturalista y viendo observaciones y ve la utilidad que es, ¿no? Sí. John, sí. No, no quiero hablar mucho, pero dice Alfonso que cambiaste tu, tu cámara grandota por tu celular. <laughs> Cierto. <laughs> I've gotten very lazy because I'd, I'd rather be collecting plants and just doing quick shots for identity. <laughs> but with that being said, those of you who are botanists, we need specimens, always need specimens. If you have permits and you're in the field, collect specimens. There is no substituting a, a, a specimen with a photo. Photos just do not have the same thing. But in the short term, those of you who are not, make lots of observations with your, with your cameras. We love that. That is giving us a lot more information. And, and I want to say thank you to all you guys tonight as well. So, and I apologize for my Spanish. I, I told you I haven't spoken Spanish in over a, almost a year and a half now. And, uh, I need to come to Baja California to, to brush up on my Spanish a bit. So thank you for putting up with uh, me this evening and my uh, kind of bad language. Yo creo que a todos nos pasa, John, con un año encerrado. I forgot all my Spanish too. <laughs> but... Any last minute questions? But I think we've gone way over time. But let me tell you, I do want to come down. Uh, we still have the funding. Um, and thanks to Carlos and others that I'm at INAT and National Geographic for that, but um, we are planning to come down and actually do some in-person in the field um, training with you and doing some field trips. So I'm hoping as this pandemic comes down a little bit um, and more of us are vaccinated, I can tell you like myself, I'm fully vaccinated now and uh, hopefully I'll be able to come down and, uh, and see everyone very soon. Bueno, John, muchísimas gracias y gracias a todos por acompañarnos. Si quieren compartir la presentación con los amigos y promover el evento y naturalista, uh, toda esta plática va a estar disponible en el canal de YouTube del NAT. Y creo que Lauren lo va a poner en el chat o Ana, no sé. Mm -hmm. And uh, next month, we are going to have another training. So there is another one during the... Uh, right before the City Nature Challenge, there's going to be another training. So hopefully we'll get more people out there. But so tell your friends, if you found it useful, please join or have some, them join us for the next one. I'm not sure if it's filled up or not. The U.S. ones got filled up completely, but I'm not sure we've filled all of them in Mexico yet. I'm sure it's full. <laughs> Um, favor de no olvidar que abril es el mes de ciencia ciudadana and it's also the state of biodiversity symposium at the NATS if you're interested in participating and city nature challenge and I don't know Jorge and Annie do you have any final reminders or closing oh, pues, no, pues gracias de nuevo a todos por participar o por el interés que tuvieron y pues, pues vemos que pues, John es 
el mero mero de plantas de por acá de la región, así que pues es bueno tenerlo, ¿no? Y que nos explique cómo, cómo mejorar nuestras observaciones o nuestras fotos para que se puedan identificar mejor, ¿no? Sí, gracias nuevamente, Johnny. Pues no, no ocupas mucha ayuda, la verdad, tu español es, es pues está bueno. súper bien y, y ya voy a tomar mejores fotos para que no me regañes y ya me puedas. <risa> Well, thank you, Annie, Jorge, and Sula, and Lauren, who's been behind the scenes. I want to thank her as well. She's been running this whole program. So um, if you have any questions after this, feel free to email us. Um, and you can always find my email, I think, on the web or whatever out there. So um, don't hesitate to do that if you have questions. And uh, we're all working on this together. So let's, uh, let's keep moving forward. So thank you all and have a great night. Y nos vemos en Naturalista. Sí, Hasta luego. Bye, bye. Hasta luego. Gracias. Bye. Gracias. Gracias. Gracias, Sula. Gracias, John. Gracias a todos, la verdad. Thank you. Encantador conocerles. Y fue encantador conocerles y, y ver que está. Bueno, yo sí quería agradecer mucho a, a digo, ¿no? Porque estén aquí Jorge y Ani. Ellos fueron los primeros que introdujeron Naturalista a Sedmar, que es la escuela donde nosotros trabajamos el profesor Melling y bueno aquí está también Eric que no está directamente en Sedmar pero pues son dos personas que, que están muy adictos también y